Today we're going to be talking about creating a PowerShell editor. Uh, my name is Adam Driscoll. Uh, let's see if I can fix my... There we go. Um, and yeah, we'll talk about... I'll kind of get into the details of what we're doing today after just a couple intro slides here. Um, first of all, uh, I am Adam Driscoll. I've been a Microsoft MVP for nine years now, pretty much always in the PowerShell space. Um, I'm an owner-operator of Iron Man Software. We make PowerShell Pro Tools and PowerShell Universal, um, and Universal Dashboard, that kind of thing. I'm um, a full-stack developer, so that's kind of how I got my start. I uh, went to school for that. Um, primarily a .NET developer, but I also do web development. And that's what you'll see in like PowerShell Universal Dashboard and that kind of thing. Um, author, educator, I have a blog, I have YouTube channels. Um, love doing that stuff. Uh, I'm a PowerShell fanatic, if you haven't been able to tell that yet. Um, pretty much everything I do is centered around PowerShell. I'm um, an endurance athlete. I've done two Ironman triathlons, and I have recently become a mine spotter from moving to Idaho, and I go and look at abandoned mines. And I haven't fallen in one yet, so. Um, yeah. So what do I know about editors? So this is like my kink or something. I don't know. I just have been around editors for PowerShell for a decade. So I worked at um, Quest back when they had PowerGUI, and um, yeah, so <laughs> I wasn't actually on the PowerGUI team, but I knew the PowerGUI team really well. And I actually took PowerGUI and integrated it into Visual Studio. And that was kind of the first PowerShell integration inside Visual Studio called PowerGUI VSX. Um, once Quest got rid of PowerGUI, what I actually did was implement native PowerShell support uh, in Visual Studio with PowerShell tools for Visual Studio. Um, so that's like any other language in Visual Studio. Uh, it doesn't require PowerGUI VSX or anything like that. And um, I'm still supporting that today. I think the first version of uh, Visual Studio I worked in was 2013, and now it works all the way through uh, version 2022. Um, I have an extension for Visual Studio Code. Um, it actually integrates with the PowerShell extension to like add refactoring and that kind of stuff. Um, so it's not really an editor in itself, but it does work with Visual Studio Code Editor. Um, then I really wanted to you know, suffer, so I built my own editor called <laughs> PS Script Pad. It actually started out as just a forms designer, but then people started requesting, you know, editing experience in it. So it has IntelliSense and debugging and um, syntax highlighting, terminal window, all that stuff. And uh, it's actually going to be using, it uses a lot of the classes that we're going to be talking about today. Uh, and then recently I actually uh, decided to create another editor, <laughs> which is a show PS editor. And it's a really simple editor. It actually just works in the terminal. So it uses a terminal GUI, which is a, C Sharp library for creating terminal GUIs. And it uh, has IntelliSense and syntax highlighting and error checking, and you can even execute scripts in it. So, uh, cool little project, but again, using similar APIs that we're going to be seeing today. All right, uh, what are we doing here today? So, first of all, we're going to go over some editing concepts. So, I'll be talking about um, you know, PowerShell hosting, uh, a little bit about um, editing and terminals, and, or editing and uh, editors in general, because it's kind of the same between uh, editors. Um, then we're going to implement editing features manually. So this is kind of the way I've always done it, is the hard way. Um, and that's using the PowerShell SDK directly, hosting PowerShell directly, um, calling the PowerShell classes directly. Uh, and then after we're done with that, which will actually take up a, a big chunk of this uh, demo, um, we're going to talk about the language server protocol. So that's what VS Code uses. And it actually communicates with PowerShell editor services, which is Microsoft's open source um, thing that kind of runs uh, VS Code. So we'll talk about what the, what the language server protocol is, why it's cool. Um, and then we're going to actually implement the language server protocol in Visual Studio. So um, I have it, it as the easy way because I've been trying to <laughs> integrate uh, editor services in Visual Studio for about five years now. So. Um, this is the furthest I've got, and I'll show you uh, kind of where we're at and why it's cool. So, um, yeah. A little bit of a disclaimer. Um, this is going to be C-sharp heavy. We're not going to do much PowerShell here, actually. We're going to be using the PowerShell SDK, so you're going to see kind of internals of PowerShell, I'd say. Um, we are going to look at a little XAML, because I'll talk a little bit about the, the platform I picked for this demo. Um, and then we're going to spend a lot of time in VS Code and Visual Studio. And this will be very exciting for me, but I don't know about for anyone else. So. <laughs> All right, so let's talk a little bit about the, the hard way of doing things. So we are going to kind of do some of this. Uh, we're not going to do everything, but 
Um, the hard way is you have to first host PowerShell. So um, there's actually a NuGet package I'll talk about in a sec that you can bring into your .NET application that will actually give you the entire PowerShell runtime. Uh, it also includes some um, built-in modules. So um, you get things like, uh, you know, like write host and that kind of stuff come in as other modules. Um, then you need to parse text at the right time. So anytime anyone types something, uh, you have to parse the document and do syntax highlighting, um, display errors correctly um, on every character. Because if you think about it, when you're typing in Visual Studio Code and stuff like that, um, as long as it's working, it's showing you things like that. Um, then you need to lint the document yourself. So a uh, linter kind of looks for code errors or suggestions, and that's what PS Script Analyzer is. So as you're typing, it's more or less invoking PS Script Analyzer and um, providing suggestions and um, fixes to those suggestions. Uh, then you need to handle code completion um, manually. And if you were using the VS Code extension um, maybe two years ago, uh, this was a big problem for them, right? So it's like it's not an easy thing to fix. Um, but there are actually, um, there's actually a single class you can call in the PowerShell SDK to handle the code completion um, yourself. So we'll look at that. Uh, then you need to deal with the text editor directly. So um, every text editor is you know, has similar concepts, but a different API. So uh, we're going to be looking at an uh, Avalonia edit today, which is an open source project. Um, but I've worked with like Active Pro and the Visual Studio SDK, and they have similar concepts, but you still got to like dig out um, how to do it correctly. How do I syntax highlight? How do I do code completion? How do I, uh, you know, put squiggles under stuff? And we'll talk a little bit about uh, some of the struggles I had with Avalonia edit today. Um, I actually have scaffolded out an app, and I'll share the GitHub link if you guys want to follow along at all. Um, and uh, we're going to just kind of inject the PowerShell pieces in there so we don't have to, you know, do a lot of that dealing with the editor directly during this talk since it's not really what it's about. Uh, and then finally, you have to execute the code by hand. So um, you have to create a run space, you have to execute the code, and then you have to make sure it doesn't crash. So there's lots of stuff going on, and text editors are actually, like, pretty complicated, um, especially code-based ones. So um, there's a lot going on, and we're going to kind of dig into the details of the hard way. And that will kind of set us up to see why the LSP and PowerShell editor services is so cool. All right. Uh, first of all, let's talk a little bit about hosting PowerShell. So like I said, there's a NuGet package. Um, NuGet.org, you can go and get this package, Microsoft PowerShell SDK. Um, and that's what's going to give you the entire PowerShell runtime and those built-in modules. Um, once you have that installed inside your .NET application, what we're going to do is we're going to create an execution environment called the run space. So if you're an advanced PowerShell user, you might have just used these in PowerShell. People use, usually use them for like uh, background jobs and threading and that kind of thing. Um, but they all have their own scope. So uh, more or less they have modules, variables, providers, that kind of thing. Um, and you'll usually have one or more run spaces in a .NET application, but in editors, it's, it's more than likely that you only have one. Um, and then uh, you, you may build a custom host. So in PowerShell Universal, we have custom hosts for like read host and write host because like it's a web app and you can't just like print to the console and that kind of thing. So you can actually create a custom host. In our case, we pop up like message boxes inside the, the web app when read host happens um, and write output like write information or error, that kind of thing, it's piped into the database. So um, that's another kind of aspect of hosting um, PowerShell. So we're not actually going to get into custom hosts today. Um, it would be way too long of a presentation if we just implemented the entire thing. So we're going to kind of <laughs> stick to the basics, which is going to be enough. Um, handling text. So again, the, the PowerShell SDK actually pr uh, provides classes for doing this. So it has a parser class that you can just say parse input and it's going to produce three things. It's going to produce an abstract syntax tree. So um, if you've never used an AST before, um, it's kind of like an object representation of the text document. So you'll see things like, you know, this is an if statement, and these are the two different sides of the if statement. Um, these are, you know, constants within the document. And then what that is uh, primarily used for are things like linting, because you can write um, kind of complex queries ac across the document without using just tokens and like calculating like offsets and stuff. You just have this like, you know, object model that you can look at. And that's what PS Script Analyzer uses like really heavily. Uh, the other thing it does is it checks for syntax errors. So uh, it will just return a list of errors. So if you have like a bracket that's open but not closed and you get that little red squiggle, that's the parser telling us that that is missing. 
And then finally, it returns tokens. Um, and those are just like, um, you know, chunks of the document with like an offset and a type. So it's like, uh, this chunk is a string, this chunk is, you know, a condition, this chunk is a variable or a constant, uh, that kind of thing. So the parser will provide us with all that information. Uh, the other thing that the PowerShell SDK provides is the command completion class. So that is just a class inside um, the PowerShell SDK, and you can uh, provide the document that you are working with, like the text of the document, and where your cursor is currently located. So I'm at offset like 150, and then it does all the work of telling you like what variables um, to complete or what commandlets or arguments, that kind of thing. So yeah, it does variables, parameters, commands, classes, methods, um, provider paths, all that kind of thing. Um, automatically for you, and it's a very thin API actually, so um, we will uh, look at using that. And then finally, um, you have to deal with the text editor. So all text editors are kind of similar um, in terms of like the, how they're developed, or how they're like structured. So the main thing is a virtual and visual document. So the, the virtual document being like the text of the document, and any markers you might have on the text, like this chunk of code, you know, is either it requires a you know a squiggly line or it's like you know this token and needs like you know this um, colorization, but it doesn't actually display that to the user. And then you have the like the visual document, and if you've you know played with VS Code enough, you you can kind of see that they put all these things into the document that are not actually part of the document. Like if you have Git lens in there, it'll tell you when it was last checked in and by whom. Um, you'll get little like um, like pop-ups about like code fixes and stuff like that. And then you have the squiggles. Like those are not actual parts of the text document, but they're all like um, things that the editor itself is augmenting into the visual document. Um, you have to be aware of editing and edited states and um, kind of, you'll, we'll, we'll see that today when we're doing uh, code completion. Like as people are typing, you want things to be happening. Um, but by the end of this, we're gonna have a really crappy slow editor that uh, <laughs> it's, it's functional, but uh, it, uh, it won't work very well. Uh, and then there's things like overlays, glyphs, and context menus. So there's like all kinds of crap inside a text editor, and uh, like I said, everyone has its own API a little bit. All right, um, today we are gonna be using Avalonia. So Avalonia is an open source, I think it's just community like supported. I don't know if there's like a corporate backer to it, but um, it actually works uh, cross-platform um, Windows, Linux, Mac, it even works on like, you know, Android, and Raspberry Pi, and stuff like that. So they actually have like a desktop flavor and a mobile flavor. We'll be looking at the desktop flavor today. Um, and it's pretty cool. Uh, it's, it's come a long way in the last couple of years. It's still a little rough around the edges, but it's very similar to WPF. So they actually have the XAML concept, and um, yeah, so we'll, we'll be playing with that for this demo. All right. So, what are we gonna do here today? We are gonna create PS Code, you get it. Um, it is uh, gonna be a .NET 6 app. It's gonna use the PowerShell SDK, and then we're gonna use Avalonia and Avalonia Edit. So, um, yeah, Avalonia being like the overall framework, and Avalonia Edit is actually a port of a, a WPF editor that it works in Avalonia and is cross-platform. So, that's kinda where we'll get into the text editor stuff. So, let's pop into our first demo here. Oops. All right. I have code. I'm going to set this up. I'm actually using my phone as a second monitor or third monitor, I guess. Let's see if that works. <clears throat> I just got to get this. Correct. Okay. So let's make sure this is the right VS code. It is. All right, so, a <laughs> bunch of using statements. So I'm gonna show you the kind of the structure of this uh, application. Oh, before I do that, actually what I'm gonna do is, if you do wanna follow along at all, you can go to GitHub, and I'm just go PS code, uh, and pull this down. So this actually has all the code in it. This has both the code for what we're looking at in, right now, and then what we're gonna look at a little later with the VS Code extension. So, um, feel free to jump on that. I'll let you take the picture. I have links at the end of this too, so 
All right, now let's make sure I'm opening the right VS Code editor. Yes. All right. So this is a kind of a standard .NET 6 application um, set up for Avalonia. So I actually got this from the Avalonia uh, repository, more or less, and then put the text editor in and stuff like that. So um, newer .NET projects are actually pretty thin, which is nice. Um, you used to have so much stuff in these CS proj files. Um, but you can see here that we're just kind of creating a WinXC targeting .NET 6 um, runtime identifiers. So if you want to compile it for a different platform, you can do it for Windows 7, Linux, or OS X. Then we're going to be including um, CS files. So those are C Sharp files. It's going to compile those um, into the uh, editor. And then these are some things for um, Avalonia. So uh, we have some XAML files that we're going to be using that we want to include, and then um, some XAML.cs files, which is kind of the code behind for uh, those windows and controls. And then these are the packages that I'm referencing. So I'm using Avalonia Desktop. Um, like I said, there's a, a mobile edition as well. I'm using Avalonia Edit, which is the text editor that we're going to be playing with. Um, I'm using Avalonia Edit, the TextMate. I'll be talking a little bit about what TextMate is, but it pretty much provides syntax highlighting. Uh, bringing in a message box, and then finally, um, the Microsoft PowerShell SDK. So uh, we're using PowerShell 7.2.2 .2 right now for this demo. All right. um, kind of similar to what you would see in a WPF app, you have an uh, app.xaml. This is kind of the entry point for your um, Avalonia app. Um, there is some stuff in here. Like, if you actually created one of these um, just blank, it, it would not have anything in the app that, um, application like content here. But I'm setting um, a dark mode theme. I'm including the styles for uh, the editor, because it has its own styles. And then a completion list, which um, it, it, like, is supposed to style the completion list. It's not perfect. Like, something's wrong with it. You'll see. Uh, and then the code behind for that is pretty s simple. Like you'd find examples of this for Ava on the Avalonia site. Uh, you create an application, you load up the XAML, so that's what we just looked at. And then um, in this case, since we're doing a Windows desktop, we are going to create this main window and set that as like what we're going to display when this application starts. From there, we're actually going to jump into our window. So. Um, we just have a, a window here that has a doc panel inside it. And doc panels just kind of let you uh, pin things to um, different places. So I have a stack panel that I'm pinning to the top. And that just has a button in it that's going to uh, run stuff. And we're going to hook that up. And then at the bottom, I have a status bar uh, that's pinned to the bottom. And we're just going to put status text in there. And I'll show you how we kind of update that. And then finally, we just have the text editor in the middle. So. It has a bunch of like formatting stuff on it, like fonts and margin and that kind of thing. And then in the back of the window, in the code behind, that's what I had open originally. And this is where like all the guts of the editor are. Um, I didn't take any time to make this look nice, really. <laughs> uh, so it's all in pretty much one file. And um, pretty much what this is doing is when it starts up, we're, we're getting different controls. So we're getting the, the, but, the run button hooking up what happens when that's clicked. I mean, this is similar to what you'd even see in Windows Forms. Um, and status text. So this is so we can update the status text when certain things happen. And then finally, we're grabbing the editor. Uh, yeah? Uh, it's slightly different, but they do have a uh, visual editor for Avalonia extension. So you can install it in the Visual Studio. Yeah, right, exactly. So yeah, they, they definitely have an editor that you can install. Uh, well, this was like, uh, I, I tried to use the editor, but like I didn't get something quite right. It actually took a, a, a sample. So that's what this is. Um, and it wasn't, it wasn't actually the XAML that was a problem. It was actually a bunch of like the CS Proj stuff I had wrong. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I, if I were to build an app myself, I would use the Visual Designer for sure. So, um, yeah, but it, it, it looks and feels a lot like WPF. They even used like a lot of the same method names and class names for the controls and stuff like that. So it'll be really familiar when you get in there. But um, yeah. Uh, all right, so yeah, we're just setting up the text editor. 
and you know, I'm turning on line numbers. I've created a context menu that can copy, paste, format, that kind of thing. Um, we are hooking up a couple event handlers. Uh, we're going to be using this text entered event handler for a lot of things because um, we want to syntax highlight, um, code complete, check for errors in syntax, and check for um, uh, PS script analyzer suggestions. So we're going to do all that in text entered. Um, text entering is going to be used for actually filtering the completion list. So as you're entering text, it's like filtering the completion list as you type in it. Uh, setting up some other things like indentation, um, strategy, sorry. And finally, we get into theming. So this is like what you, you know, this is where you start to get into like, I need to know a lot about this text editor to uh, do stuff. So um, I'm setting up a theme registry. The current theme is that dark theme that I set. Um, then I'm installing TextMate into that registry. And um, I'm getting a language. In this case, right now, it's a .cs language. And um, creating a text document, setting the grammar <laughs> to that language, and then um, we will display that in the text editor. So I'll show what that looks like in a sec. And we'll kind of get into the details of TextMate in a sec, too. Uh, this text marker service is actually used for um, drawing lines under stuff. So if you want to mark text with like syntax errors or um, PS script analyzer suggestions, that's what we're going to use that for. Uh, this is for zooming in and out, so I can scroll in and out. And um, finally, this, when you move the carrot around, what we're going to use this for is actually displaying um, where in the document you are. Um, Visual Studio Code has something similar where you can actually see which line and column you're on. And then if we are at a text marker, like a syntax error or a PS script analyzer um, suggestion, we're going to display that message in there. So that is a lot of stuff. And this is like one of those things where you're like, you really got to know um, the API for this. And it took me a long time. Like the text marker stuff, just I, as an aside, they don't have that built in, but I found some random guy that wrote this. So there's this huge class for actually like d drawing stuff. It's like doing geometry and all this stuff to like draw everything. I'm like, wow, I'm really glad I found that. So, um, again, that's up on the... Yeah. Yeah, and we'll get into that. So I, I'm, I'm going to show you uh, a demo of this and then we'll get it switched over to uh, PowerShell and start doing that. So. Mm hmm yep. So yeah, we're going to, like, this is like bare bones right now, and I'm just going to run this, um, and we'll see what that looks like. So yeah, we, right now it's not integrated with PowerShell at all. So now we have our little editor. It's got our run button. It's got a little status thing on the bottom that says ready. And then um, as I'm typing, you can see the line and columns are updating. Um, it, like I said, is set to CS right now, so you'll see that the, like, C-sharp style syntax, actually I can zoom in, I think. Ooh. Um, is working. So, um, very basic. We have our basic text, text editor up and running. Um, but now what we're going to do is kind of change this so that it works with PowerShell. All right. Stop that guy. So, the first thing we're going to do is get PowerShell syntax um, in here. So, uh, one thing I found uh, with this particular editor is that they actually have it built in. So, I can literally just go PS1. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about how that works in a sec, though. Um, we just got lucky here. Not all editors have PowerShell syntax built in. But now, since I changed that to PS1, it's changing my syntax. And now you can see that um, just like the uh, CS stuff, now my um, PowerShell syntax highlighting is working. So that is not always the case. Like, um, Sometimes you have to use tokens. That's what we do in the Visual Studio extension. Um, and um, sometimes you can use TextMate. So internally, this is using TextMate. And that's what like, all this stuff was doing. Um, it's installing TextMate. And it actually has the TextMate document in it um, so that uh, it knows how to do the syntax highlighting. So if you're not familiar with TextMate, what you can do is if you go to PowerShell slash editor syntax. Um, the PowerShell team actually, uh, they support this TM language file. So that's a TextMate language file. And um, 
It's just this XML document that um, defines how to uh, syntax highlight a document. So this is like a standard concept, and this is what Visual Studio Code uses to syntax highlight their documents. So you can see like there's like a huge XML document about um, all the different um, aspects of a PowerShell script and how to color it and what those tokens mean and that kind of thing. So. Uh huh. Yep. Yep. Uh, you probably could, and there's probably some reason that it does that, though. I know they were talking about because the thing is, if you have tokens and you do it that that way with the actual parser, then it's it could be smarter. So I'm not sure if there's like some limitation of this that's causing that, but yeah, you should be able to modify this potentially, like if it if it matches um, requires, you know, like color it different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you could. Yeah, I don't know enough about TextMate to tell you um, what if there's a limitation there, but you know, theoretically, you should be able to do that. So, um, yeah, and this is all on GitHub, and I'm sure they are open to suggestions. Maybe they even have issues for that. You can see there's 63 issues about that. Um, yeah, so. Oh, yeah. Requires syntax highlighting bug. <laughs> there you go. All right. Um, now, let's see. Make sure we go to the right one. There we go. All right. So now we have syntax highlighting. So let's take the next step and kind of get the actual PowerShell SDK uh, integrated in here. Um, I already referenced the NuGet package, uh, but I want to like create a PowerShell environment, and we're going to do that with a run space. So I'm going to create a new run space up here. And good old GitHub Copilot completing everything for me. Um, and look at that. Isn't that kind of scary? I just hit enter. <laughs> yep, that's what I want. So pretty much uh, to create a run space, all you have to do is call run space dot create run space, uh, or run space factory, sorry, uh, create run space. And that will return a run space that then you can execute PowerShell in. Um, by default, you know, most .NET applications do not have a run space in them, so you need to create at least one to run PowerShell. Uh, next, we need to do run space that open. Uh, make sure that run space is open. So um, at this point, we have PowerShell running inside our uh, editor. So it doesn't do anything yet, but um, we are going to make it do something. So the first thing that I am going to um, implement is code completion. So like I said, we have a um, text editor, text area, text entered. So when the text has been entered, so this is like, it is in the document. We also have text entering, so before it's in the document. So you have to be kind of aware of those two states. Um, but what we're going to do here is put some code completion in. So uh, what I'm actually going to do is create a new method called complete, and we will call complete from uh, that text entered. So we're actually going to do three things in here. We're going to do code completion, uh, syntax checking, and um, PS script analyzer stuff. So code completion is, uh, like I said in the slides, is there's actually a command completion class directly in the PowerShell SDK, which is really nice. And you can literally just do complete input. And yeah, it's like very simple. Um, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, it is. All right, uh, and now, yeah, we're, we're passing in the text editor text um, that's currently entered in there. And again, um, this is kind of freaking me out with the, uh, it's not totally right. You can see that was kind of off. Um, we can, we do want the caret offset. So that is actually where in the editor are we? So it's like zero through X, um, wherever we are in the editor. Uh, that's where we want to do the command completion, and it's going to give us suggestions. Uh, and then finally, we just need to, there's like an options hash table. I honestly don't even know uh, what options you can pass in there off the top of my head. And that is how you do command completion. So what's cool is then we can just do completion, and effectively uh, our IntelliSense is hooked up. Um, it's not going to display anything, because we now need to hook that command completion into the editor. But I will show you kind of what this looks like um, inside of here. Let's kind of 
compiling and running. All right, so now if I hit like a, a dollar sign, it's gonna, oh, I forgot to do something. So it's complaining that there's no run space available. Um, and that's because I didn't set, what they call it the default run space. It doesn't know where to run this command completion. And since I'm trying to like look up a variable, it needs to know about a run space. So let's do that. And do that, you just do run space, default run space, and we're using that run space that we created. So we do that. And there's my document. Now if I hit dollar sign, hopefully it doesn't throw an exception. And we look at this completion uh, variable here, and you can see we have 150 completion matches. And if we expand that, you're gonna see we have completion results, and each one of these is gonna be a variable. So it has things like completion text, uh, list item text, which would be like what you display potentially, um, a tool tip, um, which in this case it's saying that this is a bool, and then for each one of the variables it just has provided me with completion matches. So that's why I said like this is actually a pretty cool, thin, easy to use API, like there's not much going on here. It gets more difficult uh, actually dealing with the editor, <laughs> which I'll show you now. All right, so I'm gonna use my tiny little screen here that has my to actually update this method to integrate with the editor itself. All right, so the first thing that we need to do is create a completion window. So um, this really has nothing to do with PowerShell. It's mostly just uh, Avalonia edit. Um, it's creating a new completion window. We're passing in the text area so it knows how to like orient the completion window, which it is actually calculating incorrectly, which you'll see. And then when we close it, we're just setting it to null. Um, now what we need to do is actually take those completion items and put them into the um, completion window. So I will take that and I'm gonna put this over here. So I'll step through this. Um, the completion window has this completion data uh, parameter on it, sorry, uh, or property on it. And that's just a list of completion items that we're gonna show in the window. And then we go through each one of the matches, which is what we looked at in the debugger, and we're gonna effectively um, create a completion data and store it in that list, and then eventually show the completion window. So that's a lot of like Avalonia edit stuff, but pretty much everything is like, every time I've implemented an editor, it's like converting this completion match to the thing that the editor wants. Uh, you can see we're getting an error right now, and that's because uh, it wants the text editor input args. And I'll talk about that in a sec. Um, I'm checking like what character was just entered. And the reason I'm doing this is because if you type like get process and then you com code complete it, what would actually be inserted was get hyphen, get hyphen process. So I'm actually splitting on that hyphen and only inserting the second half of it. That's the reason I, I did that. All right. So now, with all this code in here, we should be able to get code completion. Oh, I broke, oh, I know what it is. We gotta pass this E in there. All right, right? Yeah, okay. So now, let's see if we can get this code completion to pop up. Oop, there you go. So now we have code completion, you can see it's like, in the wrong spot, and I'm pretty sure if I actually use it, it actually inserts too many um, dollar signs, but we're close. <laughs> um, it also will work for uh, get. You can see like it's kind of slow, um, and anytime I do anything, it's running the code completion. So if I space or I type anything, it's doing code completion. And to avoid that, what we can actually do is check the character again. So we did e dot text isn't equal to a dollar sign, then don't do the code completion. Because the code completion process, although very easy to use, is very slow. Um, especially uh, the first time it goes, it's gotta like cache a bunch of stuff and everything. And you can imagine it's looking at all the run space state for variables and providers that are loaded and what path you're on and all that kind of stuff. So you definitely wanna exit early if you can. So in this configuration now, it'll only do co code completion when um, I do the dollar sign. And typically what I'll do with editors is um, I will, yeah, you can see now, like the typing is fast again. Um, 
and code completion still works for uh, variables. And you know, after the first time, it's much faster, but after it has to like initialize that. All right. So we can put additional characters in there and that kind of thing if we wanted um, or code completion. So that is code completion. But now let's actually look at how to provide like feedback about uh, syntax errors. So that's done using the parser class. So what I'm going to create is a uh, parse method. Oh no. Okay. Parse method down here. And we're actually going to um, display some stuff in the editor for this parser. All right, so let me get my example up for me. If I, could. I love this computer, but I always right click so much on accident. All right. So the parser, similarly in the PowerShell uh, SDK, is actually pretty straightforward. Um, I'm actually going to close this. Uh, and we're just going to do parser, which is the PowerShell parser, and we can do parse input. And again, we want text editor.txt. And what that's going to output are three things. Tokens, which we're not going to use in this demo, actually. Uh, parser errors. And it also returns the AST, which I'm also not going to use. Um, for this particular example. So uh, what we're actually after right now is the parser errors. So if you actually look at one of those errors, it has things like uh, a message, um, whether or not it's incomplete input, and then the extent uh, pretty much tells you where in the document this is happening. So at what offset is um, this error being shown? And that's where we'll draw the squiggly line. All right, so I won't make you Watch me type this. Because this is, again, just converting pretty much to uh, what Avalonia Edit wants. But I will go through it. Um, and I actually have this as a bool, and I'll talk about why that is. So the first thing that we do is we actually remove any existing markers. So uh, if there was an error marker, we want to clear it all out. Like, you can be, like, more strategic about this. Like, uh, you know, if a part of a document didn't change, you don't necessarily need to parse the whole document again. but um, I'm just clearing everything out that's tagged with error. Um, and then we're getting through, going through all the errors that were returned by the PowerShell parser, uh, and then creating markers for each one of those errors. So you can see I'm using that extent to calculate where in the document to create that marker. So start offset, and then end offset by start offset gives us the length of that error. Then I'm setting a tooltip, which doesn't work. It's funny, they have this property, but it's not hooked up at all. And then, um, we're tagging it as error. We're setting a normal underline, so it's just going to be like a straight line. It won't actually be squiggly. Uh, and then the marker color is going to be red. So you can see RGB and 255 for red. And then I'm returning true or false from this if there are any errors. All right. So let's go ahead and see what that looks like. All right, so now if I actually go like this, you can see I get a little red line there. Amazing. And uh, if you look at the bottom there in the status bar, um, since I kind of hooked up that uh, thing that checks for whether or not the cursor is in a marked segment, it's going to give us the little error. So it's probably hard to see, but it says missing the closing brace. Um, and if I were to actually edit this document again and put that closing brace, um, we have the error go away. I think the same thing will happen for like a string. So we're missing the terminating string. Thing. So there is parser errors. So next, I want to uh, implement um, PS Script Analyzer integration. So uh, this is a little more involved because there's a couple different ways you can do PS Script Analyzer uh, integration. One is via the PS Script Analyzer module. It has actually um, an invoke script analyzer commandlet that will analyze your script. Um, the other way of doing it is they actually have a C-sharp kind of API that you can use. Um, but what I'm going to do is actually use the, uh, I'm going to use the PowerShell module so that we can see how to like execute PowerShell inside your editor. So we're going to do analyze. Okay. So um, in order to analyze, we need to actually execute that commandlet get some um, you know, feedback back from it, and then do that text marker thing again. 
So uh, the first thing that I'm going to do is just um, show you how to execute PowerShell in here. So I'm going to use var equals PowerShell. Oh, man. I have to create. So this is the easiest way to execute PowerShell in C Sharp. Uh, just using PowerShell.create will create you know, a new PowerShell pipeline. And um, the reason I'm saying using is because it's disposable, which means uh, if you don't uh, dispose of it, you're going to leak resources and potentially memory. Uh, and from there, we need to set the run space to our run space. So we want to execute the PS script analyzer inside the run space here. And um, what you can do then is add commands to your pipeline. So I am going to do invoke script analyzer to actually invoke the script analyzer. And then I'm going to add a parameter to that command, which is, go out of here, script definition. And get out of here. OK. Let's see if that completed correctly. Yep. So now I'm calling invoke script analyzer, uh, passing in a script definition, and passing in the text of the editor. Uh, and then what we can do is just invoke that pipeline. And that will return our suggestions. All right. I need to put that in here. So we're going to parse, analyze, and then code complete. Um, now let's just see what that looks like uh, in the debugger. And then we'll hook it up to the actual editor for display. All right, so if I type any character, it is running. So I think that's not going to have any suggestions. Let's actually get it a suggestion. G. And P. All right, so GP is an alias for something. So uh, I can get item property. And now you can see that. Um, my suggestion here is this PS object, and uh, sorry, PS object, and if we go to the dynamic view, you can actually it's like a easier view to see things. Um, you can see that GP is an alias uh, of get item property. Avoid using command aliases. So that actually came out of PS script analyzer. So I looked at the script, saw that I'm using GP, and it wants to suggest that I don't use that. All right. So let's stop that and hook it up to our editor again. This is going to be, look very similar to the other way that we did this because it's using that text marker service again. So I want to clear out that. And then I want to iterate through all the suggestions and create markers for each one. Uh, I'm not. But what's interesting, I, I'll show you in the debugger in a second because Suggestions actually have a additional property on there for the code fixes. So it actually will tell you, you know, w what extent and what to do and that kind of thing. So um, I'm not doing that in this demo, but um, yeah. Um, I think in this, yeah, usually I, I do it for more control. Uh, I'll create a run space at the top, and then I, I typically when I create a run space like that, I'm initializing it with something too. So um, if you want just like a default run space, you could definitely do that. Uh, well, I'll, I'll show you that. Well, is that today? No, okay. that was it. But um, no, no, you're fine. You're fine. Uh, what you can do there's actually I'll just show you right now. Um, I think we got time. Um, there is actually this uh, class that you can use called initial um, run space state or initial session state dot create. And then in there, you can do all kinds of things like setting commands, execution policy, you can load modules, you can set variables, that kind of thing. Um, I don't know, maybe. I've never used one of those before, um, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. 
I bet there is some API for loading that, and it probably generates one of these. Because um, then you just pass that into the run space here, and it will actually use that when it creates the run space. So that, that's usually why I create run spaces, because I'm usually uh, messing with the initial session state. But yeah, in this case, like, you really wouldn't have to necessarily. You could just do PowerShell.create. Um, yeah, so now I've got my suggestions. Um, it's similar to the thing before. I'm just using dynamic, which is a, a keyword in C Sharp that allows you to access dynamic um, languages. So PowerShell is kind of a dynamic language. And the PS object uh, that comes out of PowerShell is actually supports dynamic, which is really nice because what's interesting is like, you see how when I hover over extent, it says it's dynamic? Um, that type is determined at runtime. Uh, so extent doesn't actually exist. Like if I try to do like suggestion dot, you know, it's not going to give me any IntelliSense because it doesn't know what properties are there. So that's where you'd use a dynamic. And uh, in this case, it has an extent property, and I can use that to create my text marker. I'm setting a message, and I'm actually going to highlight this one as green. So 255 for green. All right. So let's try that. <clears throat> All right, so we do G, someday, oh, I have a breakpoint there. Oh, this might be a good time to show you, oh, there's no suggestions yet, though. That's okay. G, P. All right, so now it highlights it green. So um, I can move around, and you can see that on the bottom there, it's giving me the script analyzer suggestion for why that is green. Um, I think if I set a breakpoint in here, I don't know if this one will actually have a code fix, though. Um, well, actually, it should, because it'll expand that alias. Uh, let's try this. So if we look at this suggestion, dynamic, I want to say, yeah, suggested corrections is the property. So if I go to suggestion, can I see that? I don't know. But yeah, you can access this um, suggested corrections. Um, oh, there it is. Yeah. Why won't you let me expand it? But yeah, that'll have a list of the suggested corrections. And then you could have the little light bulb that says, like, fix this. And it has, like, all the information about how to fix it. So that's all coming out of Script Analyzer um, for us. And like I said, you can use this as a .NET uh, library. I'm just using it as the PowerShell um, module. And the reason you'd probably use the .NET library in a, a circumstance like this would be uh, speed, because you don't have to like create a PowerShell run space. Um, and uh, it's typed then. You don't have to worry about doing a dynamic and all that kind of stuff. All right, so the last thing I want to hook up is running a script. So we have a run button. And what we're actually going to do is run our script. So let's do using. RPS equals PowerShell dot create, and I want to run it in my run space. Oh, it was so close. Run space, and then we're going to do PS dot add script, which allow, allows you to add like arbitrary text to the the, um, the pipeline rather than doing like add command, add parameter, that kind of thing. So I'm just going to add the editor text to that, and call invoke. So very simple way of invoking our text editor here. All right. Now, you're going to see the fun of us hooking all those things up in the text editor. Because as I type, it's going to be very slow process. And we're going to start Notepad. So if we click Run now, Notepad starts. We're actually executing PowerShell from our uh, PowerShell editor. One thing that doesn't work, though, is if I have an error such as this one, a missing parameter kind of seems like nothing's happening. So what we can do there is you can actually handle errors inside um, PowerShell scripts in a couple different ways. One is uh, when you invoke a PowerShell script, you can catch the terminating error. So just like you would catch it in PowerShell, you actually can catch it in C Sharp. Um, and you would just do catch exception E, and then do something with that exception. Um, the other thing that you need to worry about, though, when you're executing PowerShell is uh, non-terminating errors. So you can check for non-terminating errors by doing ps.hadErrors, and then access the error stream. So 
um, for each bar error in uh, ps.streams error. And we're, what I'll do is I'll just uh, pop a message box up in there. Somewhere I have an example of that. All right. So copy that over here. If I can find my mouse. There it is. All right. So we're just using that Avalonia message box thing to pop up a message. So I'm just going to do um, error.to string. All right, so now if we execute this, we should, what? Oh, I think we're using that variable. Yeah. Um, we should see an error pop up uh, instead of it just being silent when there's errors. Start. Run. And now you can see that it, it popped up our error message. That came right out of the PowerShell error stream. So. That was implementing an editor the hard way. Um, there, obviously, like this editor is not great. It has a lot more work to do, and um, it doesn't support everything an editor should support. You know, we didn't hook up a lot of stuff. So, um, for this next section, I'm actually going to get into how um, how to uh, implement an editor in the easy way uh, that VS Code and Visual Studio use, along with some other editors. So, I'm going to jump back to slides for just a sec. Like I said, this is all on GitHub, so. Um, you can go pull that down. It's actually completed. It doesn't have all the missing parts that uh, I entered just now. It's actually the complete editor. So let's go talk a little bit about the easy way now. So um, how do I, oh, I'll just unplug this. <laughs> all right, closer. All right, so the easy way is using the language service protocol and the, I think it's actually the debugging protocol, not the debugging service protocol, but um, you're going to be using those two protocols and it should just work. So uh, you don't have to worry about your text editor, you don't have to worry about um, PowerShell SDK, you only have to worry about hooking up those two protocols to PowerShell editor services. And the way that works is, um, this is kind of an example of how it works for multiple editors. So on the top there you can see we have VS Code and Visual Studio 2017. 2017 is when they added the uh, LSP to Visual Studio. Um, it is now supported through 2022. Uh, and then in Visual Studio Code, all languages use the LSP. So um, it communicates over JSON RPC calls. So that's kind of like those things in the middle. You probably can't read what that says, but you know, things like I opened a document or I entered text or I'm looking for um, code completion stuff. Um, it'll send messages back and forth to the language server protocol implementation there at the bottom. So the language server protocol implementation of PowerShell is PowerShell editor services. So it listens for um, these JSON RPC calls and then provides uh, information back to the editor and then the editors know what to do with that. You don't have to worry about doing all the text marking or like creating the code completion window, um, all that stuff. So uh, this is kind of an example LSP request. So development tool would be like Visual Studio Code uh, and then the language server would be PowerShell editor services running in uh, a PowerShell editor or a PowerShell instance. And user opens a document, it notifies PowerShell editor services. Uh, if the user edits the document every single text change that you make in VS Code is actually sent up to PowerShell editor services so that it can, um, it can analyze it and provide suggestions and do code completion and stuff like that. Uh, and you can see then in the server, um, it looks for errors and suggestions and sends those back to the editor, which then the editor displays. And then the LSP supports other features like go to, to definition. So in this example, um, if you execute the go to definition, it's going to request that where to go from the language server, and then finally it will move you in the development tool. So uh, the goal is that the development tool and the LSP are standardized. Um, so if the language server knows how to talk to the LSP, the development tool knows how to handle the LSP, then the um, language server author doesn't necessarily need to know anything about the development tool. So uh, that's kind of the, the goal. Um, 
And PowerShell Editor Services uh, is the implementation of that LSP for PowerShell. So it's used by the VS Code extension, um, and it pretty much does all the heavy lifting of, um, you know, running PS Script Analyzer, parsing, code completion, all that stuff in a way that is, you know, not going to slow down your editor when you type and that kind of thing. Um, it actually uses something called OmniSharp for the language server protocol implementation, which is the same thing that C Sharp uses inside VS Code. Um, PowerShell Editor Services is open source and supported by Microsoft, so you can actually go out and see how this works, um, file bugs, um, and that kind of thing. Uh, it also implements what's called the debugging protocol. So the language service protocol is actually only for editing. It's the code completion and linting and that kind of thing. But for debugging, there's a different protocol. Um, and that is for like how you execute scripts and um, set breakpoints and run the terminal commands and that kind of thing. Uh, and then finally, yeah, like I said, it has PS Script Analyzer integration. All right. Um, so working with PowerShell editor services is different. Um, you don't actually, you know, need the PowerShell SDK in your editor. Um, VS Code is no JS Electron app, so it doesn't actually couldn't load the PowerShell um, SDK directly anyways. Uh, so what it does is it starts an external PowerShell process, and um, we execute some initialization code to connect to PowerShell um, editor services. So I'll show you how this works. We're going to start a PowerShell process, start up um, PS, uh, PS ES inside that PowerShell process and then connect to it over named pipes. Um, and then finally, once that's all done, it communicates over RPC with LSP to PS, yes. <laughs> so remote, remote procedure calls with the language server protocol to PowerShell editor services. So uh, I am going to get into my pscode.vs demo. So um, some of this I've already done. I'm just going to kind of go through the, the code. I'll show you where to get the PowerShell Editor Services package. They don't actually publish it on the PowerShell gallery or anything like that. You actually have to go to the GitHub releases. Um, and then we're going to start and manage an external PowerShell process uh, right from Visual Studio. Uh, we're going to create a Visual Studio extension to use the PowerShell Editor Services. And then we're going to attempt to add some PowerShell inside um, uh, our experimental power, or Visual Studio instance um, for this. So um, first of all, I'm going to show you where to get PowerShell Editor services, just in case you ever wanted to. You can go to PowerShell Editor Services. So yeah, GitHub slash PowerShell slash PowerShell Editor Services. This is the, the, the engine that drives VS Code. Um, it's actually used by more than just VS Code. You can see that uh, NeoVim, uh, the IntelliJ plugin, and the Emacs plugin all use editor services. Um, and this is what implements, yeah, the LSP. So. Um, you know, the PowerShell team's always like trying to push this as like what you should use in your editors because uh, you benefit from all the work they put into that. And um, you know, it's, it's better if the, <laughs> the editor itself already uh, implements the LSP. What I found is I was looking at some of these other implementations, and I think the Emacs one in particular, or, no, it was the IntelliJ one, they actually had to implement the LSP inside IntelliJ. So like that's a lot of work too. So. But we'll see in Visual Studio that it um, does not require all that work. So to get um, PowerShell Editor Services, you just got to download the zip here. And um, I'll show you what is included in there. Actually, I forgot to open up Visual Studio. It doesn't take too long. All right. So I've actually already created this. This is actually on that same GitHub, um, PS Code GitHub. Uh, in a different folder called pscode.vs. And once Visual Studio catches up, I will show you kind of the, the guts of a Visual Studio um, extension. Uh, is dark mode hard to see? Okay. Yeah, okay. All right, so what I have in here is my VS Code, uh, or Visual Studio extension. And on the right-hand side here, you'll see that I have PowerShell Editor Services. Um, this is that zip that I downloaded from that GitHub repository. Uh, inside there, you have things like Plaster, PS Readline, um, PS Script Analyzer, uh, and then the PS Editor Services module. Um, this module contains a, a, a function pretty much to execute PowerShell Editor Services called startEditorServices.ps1. 
And you can pass in all kinds of things like your host name, your host profile name, your host version, that kind of thing to configure PowerShell editor services when it's starting up. Um, it also supports things like logging and then um, it, it communicates over named pipes or um, standard I.O. So standard I.O. has some limitations and um, I think their preferred method is to use um, the named pipes. So if you don't pass in a named pipe, it's going to generate a named pipe for you and then you just need to connect your client up to um, editor services. The other thing that I've included in here is um, the TM language file. So uh, that's how Visual Studio does the syntax highlighting if you create a language uh, service like this. So you literally just include your TM file and then you register it with Visual Studio via one of these package defs. So it says like, all right, we're opening a PowerShell file. Um, use the grammar in this uh, folder. Um, then we need to hook up um, a content definition. This just tells Visual Studio that PS1 files are PowerShell files. So you can see here that my file extension is PS1 and um, content type is then PowerShell. All right, so that is all this kind of registration stuff. And the actual like implementation of this extension is actually in here. So this is PowerShell language client.cs. And it says that content type is PowerShell. So if you're opening a PowerShell document, um, use this language client. And um, it's named PowerShell. And then the, the only thing you really need to implement in here is activate async. So what this is going to do is actually start PowerShell, start up PowerShell editor services, and connect to PowerShell editor services via the named pipe. Uh, so the first thing that I'm doing is I'm kind of locating where the bundled modules are. So that is like that PS editor services directory with PS readline and um, PowerShell editor services and um, that kind of thing. And then I need to generate a session temp details um, session.json path. And I, I provide that to PowerShell Editor Services, and what it does is it actually populates that with a bunch of information about um, PowerShell Editor Services locations, like the name pipe they connect to. Um, it, I think it's got like features and version information in there and that kind of thing. And so it'll generate that file when it's kind of up and running. Uh, next, we're going to be starting a uh, PWSH process. Um, I'm actually going to pop the window open so we can actually see it running. Um, in Visual Studio Code, you, you know, this is that integrated terminal that you see at the bottom is actually what we'd be starting here, and that's where PowerShell Editor Services is running. And um, we are setting a bunch of arguments, like no profile, and then we're setting a command to import the PS Editor Services uh, module, and then we're calling that start editor services um, function to uh, start it up. And then we pass in bundled modules, the log path, um, the session details path, so we can get that session JSON. Um, any additional modules you want. You can actually do feature flags, so like if there's experimental features you want to turn on and off, that kind of thing. And then we're going to set some host information, like this is PS code and um, profile information, version, and log level. So not all of those are required, but um, I think a lot of them are. So then uh, once we've set up the command line, we are going to call start on this. And what I'm doing is just I'm looping around waiting for that session details. Um, to exist. I think in a real real scenario you want to like fail after a while or something, but this will loop forever. Then we read that and I'm, I'm pretty much just getting the language server pipe name out of there. So I'm deserializing the JSON, I'm getting the language server pipe name out of there. Um, and passing that pipe name into the named pipe client stream. So that will connect to the named pipe in PowerShell editor services from Visual Studio. So I'm passing the pipe name in. This just means local computer. Like technically this could be running on a remote computer. I'm setting it to in out because it's going to receive and send information. And then the options are uh, asynchronous. So don't wait and write through, meaning don't buffer, just send directly to the name pipe. And then uh, the Visual Studio SDK just has this connection. So you just pass in the, uh, the read write pipe. And since the pipe or stream, and since the pipe is both reading and writing, we just use it in both cases. So that's it. <laughs> it should just work. You should be able to just edit PowerShell scripts in Visual Studio. So there's no working with the text editor. There's no doing the code completions yourself. There's no parsing yourself. Um, you're just hooking up the LSP from 
Visual Studio to PowerShell Editor Services. So I am starting up a experimental uh, instance of Visual Studio. And one limitation of um, LSPs in Visual Studio is they do not support projects. So you can see I have like PowerShell project. What am I up to? Seven. Um, they, don't, they don't work in there. They only work with um, folder access, and that's similar to what VS Code does. So I have this VS LSP folder, and if I open that, it will eventually load. And what you're going to see is there's PowerShell Editor Services starting up. So it's just in a PowerShell process. It's logged a bunch of stuff about its startup. Um, you can see that it, it's creating some host configuration, determining REPL kind, configuring the LSP transport. It wrote down the session file, all that kind of stuff. So once that session file existed, um, the extension that I wrote found it and loaded it. And now you can see that, for example, I have this variable is underlined with um, PS script analyzer information. And it's popping up the little uh, you know, thing to say like this variable is unused. So show documentation for used declared vars more than assignments. So it's actually integrated with um, LSP kind of. And you can see that like even brace matching is working and syntax highlighting is working. And the error list automatically populates. These are all things that you'd have to do manually and that's actually what we manually do in um, PowerShell tools for Visual Studio is we do all this manually. Um, you will notice that there is an exception at the top here. It says like an aggregate exception. So things are not working. So IntelliSense isn't working. Um, you know, that kind of thing. Like uh, one of the most important things that I would think an LSP would work for. It seems like um, there's something, I don't know if it's a problem with Visual Studio or with PowerShell editor services, but they just are not communicating correctly. Um, yeah. But I think once you get that fixed, like, that's it. That, that, that is your uh, editor for PowerShell and Visual Studio um, without having to, you know, implement all that stuff. So um, that was that demo. And I just want to talk a little bit about the VS Code extensions because um, it's like a working example of this. Um, so I'm just going to show you some stuff on uh, GitHub just so you can kind of, you know, correlate what I just did here with what's happening in VS Codes. So you kind of kind of have an understanding of the tool you're, you know, probably using all the time. Um, so I'm actually going to go back to this PowerPoint because it has some links for me. Um, and we're actually going to pop out to um, the VS Code extension. So like the Visual Studio extension, the VS Code extension is actually pretty thin. Like, it, there's a lot of stuff in there, and it seems like there's a lot of stuff in there, but the actual, like, language implementation stuff, um, there's not as much going on as you think. And you can kind of walk through this as we did in Visual Studio. Um, it's loading some session, or some settings. Uh, and then it's finding PowerShell, pretty much. So you can see here that either you've defined your PowerShell location, or uh, it's finding PowerShell, um, at one of the PowerShell paths, like PowerShell.exe or PWSH.exe, and it looks in a bunch of different places. Um, then, once it selects the PowerShell version, what it's actually going to do is uh, start to put together arguments. So you can see here, these are the same editor servers arguments that I used, so like host name, host profile ID, host version. They load a custom PowerShell editor services.vs code module that includes um, some additional functionality just for VS Code. Um, and then eventually, they're just going to start PowerShell and pass all that stuff in there. So it's going to call PLUSH the same way that we just did, and then pass in those arguments to create uh, the external PowerShell process. Um, the next thing that it's going to do is um, eventually, once it is ready, uh, it's going to create a language server client. So I think up here, maybe I put that in the wrong spot. It's got that session details file, so the same one that we created. And you can see here, it's actually uh, outputting that language service pipe name. And it's going to connect to that. And it does that with uh, Node.js has this like socket class and net connect. So it's passing that into there to connect. And it's going to use that socket for writing and reading from PowerShell editor services. And then uh, VS Code actually has this new language client uh, class. It's almost the exact same, I think it is the same, I think Visual Studio has I language client, but this is uh, language client. So it's like the, almost the exact same interface. And all it does is accept the connect func 
which returns that uh, connection to PowerShell editor services. And then it uses that language server client to do all the um, things inside um, Visual Studio Code uh, for like IntelliSense and um, brace matching and parsing and uh, all that kind of stuff. So um, yeah, and once that's done, it's kind of like up and running. So there's a lot of other stuff in here. Like it obviously has a lot more resiliency and it can restart. And um, there are features that the LSP does not implement. So um, you'll find other features inside this repository um, outside of what's going on here. But um, kind of that's the gist of actually hooking an LSP up to Visual Studio. All right, um, I have some links. So these are kind of the links I went through today. Uh, PS Code is the demo that I, I provided of both Visual Studio and Avalonia. Um, we have the VS Code extension, so that's what we were just looking at. You can kind of look at the actual TypeScript that's used to create the kind of the extension itself. And then P PowerShell Editor Services, that's the LSP implementation. And then uh, PowerShell Editor Syntax, which is the TextMate um, TextMate uh, files um, for uh, the language for PowerShell. So we have like, I don't know, 15, well, I think technically we have this room till 1045, but uh, we have about 15 minutes left in this presentation for any questions or anything like that, if anyone has anything. Um, feel free to shoot, or if there's anything you want to look at, let me know. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, what I actually do there is I start up a, I actually have a .NET app that runs outside. It's not even PowerShell. Um, I don't exactly recall why I did it that way. But, uh, and it communicates over, um, it communicates over like a named pipe connection info uh, to a, the run space, to a run space inside PSES process. Um, and then from there, that's kind of how it integrates with um, that particular process. So some of the things like looking up variables and stuff like that, we actually do schedule things. I wonder if I have that easily accessible. I would have to dig it out. But yeah, we actually schedule things on the main run space inside P the PowerShell Editor Services PowerShell process, uh, especially if you're looking up run spaces. A lot of this stuff doesn't require um, to be part of that process that run space directly. So like we have like refactorings and stuff like that. And those run external to the PowerShell editor services process because it's just all static code analysis. Um, but yeah, like some of this stuff we can run in our own run space, but in the same process um, for looking up things like, you know, um, I think like uh, looking up things like uh, host processes and that kind of thing. We don't actually need to be running in there or doing the reflection stuff that we do. So um, yeah. It's kind of like an external process, though. Yeah. Anything else? Cool. Well, thanks for coming. Um, I hope it wasn't too boring. And uh, if you ever have any uh, questions or you know want to get in the weeds with me, I'm always down for that. So, uh, thanks. <laughs>